For the past five years in our own spheres of influence, we've been warning a lot of people about things that would be coming, um, critical race theory, intersectionality, and so forth. Well, now, all of a sudden, and, and I'm very thankful for this, that it's become part of the public lexicon, that people now understand that one of the threats that they have is critical race theory. That's right. And now people have started to gather, uh, you know, mothers at, at school board meetings and, you know, people that are at church and so forth and saying, that's it. We're done with critical race theory. Um, and but then the response <laughs> has come just in the, over the last month. Or so, and there's several different ways that they've approached this. Um, where they've either denied that what you are talking about is really CRT, or they're saying, well, critical race theory is more of just a legal theory, or they're saying things like, you don't really understand what CRT is. Um, and really that's more of a form of gaslighting. Yeah, they don't like pushback. Right. They, don't, they aren't good at it. So just to, I agree with you, you know, things have changed, finally people are starting to get it. People are seeing critical race theory, they're seeing intersectionality and these ideas that are associated, they're seeing even, you know, elements of queer theory, but it's not really getting named. And they're waking up to this. Mama bear, I think, has become my favorite right. word in English at the moment. <laughs> Showing up to school boards, fighting back, people at church standing up, people in, in corporations are starting to work on things. Right. It, you know, and the response is hilarious because it's truly hilarious because they don't they don't like pushback. They don't have the evidence. They don't have the argument. They don't have the moral high ground. So they have to just lie. Right. And they say, oh, the people criticizing critical race theory don't know what critical race theory is. And they, they, they've never even read it. Name one author of critical race theory. You're like Richard Delgado. And they're like, ah, you know, the, Kimberly Crenshaw. <laughs> right. And you catch them and they, they're they like, well, that's, you don't you didn't understand it right. You know, and it's just one step after another to finally, well, it's a sophisticated legal theory. Of course, we're not teaching a sophisticated legal theory to fourth graders. And they're just obfuscating. And as you said, gaslighting. Mm -hmm. They're gaslighting. Uh, they're, let's make sure that people understand what gaslighting is. Yeah, first. so gaslighting, gas, the, the term gaslighting comes from a play that was written in the 30s and yeah. was made into a movie in the 40s called Gaslight. Gaslighting. And so the, 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 theme of the of the of the play in the movie is that you have this guy and he's trying to make the woman that he lives with crazy hmm. and so what he's doing is manipulating small things around the house in order to try to make her insane you know, it's kind of it's not an alfred hitchcock but it's got that you know weird screw with people vibe that's pretty nasty and so one of the things that he's doing is he's turning down the 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 flame and the gas lamp just a little bit and it's getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And then whenever she says, did that move or is the light low? He says, no, it's all in your head. Everything's exactly the same over and over and over again. So he denies the experience that she's having with her eyes, denies the experience she's having with her ears or whatever. The, the information she's gathering with her senses, denying it. And it is a form of psychological attack that's meant to destabilize the victim and make them unsure of themselves, make them uncertain of what they think they know, of mm -hmm. what's going on. And it's meant to undermine their ability to feel confident in making an argument. Mm -hmm. And it is, it should just be straightforwardly said, it is a technique of psychological abuse that is being weaponized in order to throw up smoke and protect critical race theory that has now, right. it's like the, we used to call it the Voldemort problem is like once you give it a name, People can lock, lock in on it. They can start to study it. They can start to understand it. And they can start to take it apart. And because it doesn't have evidence, arguments, or moral high ground, it's got nothing to stand on. So now they have to throw smoke up to try to protect their brand because their brand has been discovered to be bad. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about the first thing. Then. One of the first arguments is that, well, critical race theory was just a legal term and a legal tool. Uh, and of course, uh, the way they would refer back to Kimberly Crenshaw. Uh, we could talk about Derek Bell because in essence, before it was given a name um, specifically that he was already practicing critical race theory in many different ways. Right, but, right. But in terms of really defining it down, uh, how would you respond to something like that? Yeah, so critical race theory is a way, they even tell you it's a practice. Mm -hmm. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a lens. So it can be applied to anything. It did start in law. You're right to name Derek Bell. Derek Bell started working on this in the 1970s within the movement called C Critical Legal Studies, mm -hmm. um, which uses critical theory to attack law. And he was, he was bringing in elements of uh, race 
And it started to expand because a lot of the critical legal studies people were, no surprise, white scholars who were not paying enough attention, legal scholars who were not paying enough attention to, mm -hmm. the, to the elements of race in the law, according to people like Derek Bell and his associate Alan Freeman. And so they were writing about this in the 70s going into the 80s. Uh, eventually, it gets its name, Critical Race Theory, by Kimberly Crenshaw at a conference in Madison, Wisconsin in 1989. Right. Uh, Richard Delgado, who I just named, was there, uh, along with many of the Mary Matsuda and a lot of the, mm -hmm. the big original names. And she also was a lawyer. She was a student of, of uh, Bell at Harvard Law. Um, Bell was a lawyer, that, the law professor at Harvard Law, and I think at Oregon or something like that at one point, and briefly at Stanford. Um, so th it did originate in law. But if you turn to Richard Delgado's book, Critical Race Theory, an introduction, and you read the second paragraph of the book, it says it began in law and in legal studies and rapidly spread to other domains, particularly mm. education. So they love to say critical race theory is not in schools, mm. but in fact, it rapidly spread to education. This was a book written in 2001, right. 20 years ago. It was already being described as having rapidly spread from the 80s into other fields outside of law, including education as the first one he names. So... You know, this is an obvious lie. Mm. People know what they see. They hear they hear their kids learning about white privilege. They hear people, you know, even being talked about white fragility. They're having to do these privilege um, ranking things where they, you know, what they have to put down factors of their lives and figure out how privileged they are and separate themselves in their classrooms. I think they even did that in the military. Th this stuff is happening where they're separating people by privilege level that's connected to race. That's critical race theory. You can call it whatever you want, but to say it's merely a legal theory is a complete distortion. Now, here's where the distortion works. If we want to get deep into this, and this is something people who haven't studied this wouldn't know, is that a critical theory, as I've said many times, I know we've talked about this, mm -hmm. has to have at least three elements, or it doesn't qualify as a critical theory. It must describe an idealized society, in other words, a utopia, it has to explain how the present society does not live up to that mm -hmm. or isn't heading toward it. So it must complain about the existing society as not being that utopia. And it must inspire social activism on its behalf. Mm -hmm. Now, social activism is called praxis, mm -hmm. P-R-A-X-I-S. And it's theory put into practice. And if you look, read people like Paulo Ferreri, who did the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, big influence on, on critical theory and education, and we're going to spend some time, more time on him in one of yeah, our discussions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we got to talk about Paulo Ferry. Well, he says that praxis has to have an element of self-reflection. And you hear that from Robin DiAngelo. What did she say? That anti-racism is a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process right. of self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism. Mm -hmm. Praxis, mm -hmm. in other words. And praxis is the putting of a theory into application in accordance with that theory in order to achieve its goals, which is to achieve that utopian vision of society, a liberation or whatever it is, racial liberation, something, black liberation, whatever it happens to be. And so what you have is, even if they're not teaching the specific legal theory, or if they're not teaching the theori theoretical elements themselves, like they're not making fourth graders read Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw, they are putting those ideas into practice and they're doing what's called critical race praxis. And you think, well, okay, critical race praxis, that's different. That's CRP or CRAP if you want. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not critical race theory, but because theory and praxis are wedded in critical theories or critical philosophies, as Marx said, that you have to have the, the theory wedded to the praxis. Critical race praxis is critical race theory. And critical right. race theory is critical race praxis. They're actually one and the same. We're talking about a distinction without a difference because if you took the critical race praxis out, you wouldn't have critical race theory. Mm -hmm. So what they're actually telling people when they say, we're not teaching critical race theory in our schools. That was my impression of Kimberly Crenshaw's voice. <laughs> when they say that, what they're saying is we're doing critical race theory Correct. to your children. Correct. We're doing, doing it, it to your children. We're not right. teaching it, we're doing it. Right. So that's a... It, it's a lie that gives away something very valuable to understand and very ugly. They're, they're applying this intentionally racist theory to your children and with the force of the state behind it. So it's state-sanctioned racism in our schools, teaching our children to think in, in, in racially conscious, in other words, racist ways. Hmm. So let's say that you're a parent that is at a school board meeting. And at that school board meeting, they're saying, oh, no, 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 we're not teaching critical race theory. And as you said, you're doing it. How would you say that a parent should respond to something like that? They should just ask straight up, 
about the concepts that are relevant to critical race theory. Are you teaching about systemic racism? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, probably critical race theory. We, we don't have a definitive diagnosis here, right? It's like if you go to the doctor and they say, well, you have a fever. Well, they don't know you have the flu if you say yes. You might have a lot of things that cause a right. fever, right? Well, are you teaching about systemic racism? Well, that's a, that's a symptom. Are you teaching about white privilege? That's another symptom. Mm. Are you teaching, you know, about the idea of equity, you know, that we're going to try to figure out how to have more equal outcomes that's another symptom. And you start kind of identifying some of these pieces. Are you diving into intersectionality? Intersectionality is considered one of the core components. Mm. They say it's separate. This is another point they gaslight you on. They say it's separate from critical race theory. It's considered a core component of critical race theory. Kimberly Crenshaw made up both of them. Mm -hmm. Same person. There, it's, a, it's usually considered one of the pillars of critical race theory is intersectional thought. So it's another symptom. So you got to think of it like you're a doctor and you start asking questions or saying, pointing out examples. You're talking about systemic racism. You're talking about white privilege or brown privilege. You're talking about, um, you're talking about uh, intersectionality. Mm. You're trying to, are you trying to induce a race consciousness? Why are you doing that? These are kind of diagnostic questions that are going to just reveal that lie. Are you talking about equity? That was the other one that I'd mentioned. So you want to look for the things that it does. Are you um, explaining to children that they have complicity in a system of white supremacy? That is critical race theory. At that point, it's mm -hmm. cut and dry. Right now, the overwhelming chance is if they're teaching white privilege, they're teaching critical race theory. Privilege mm -hmm. is a very specific concept that comes from this way of thinking that no, you'll notice nobody talked about privilege before like 2015 and the common, you know, everyday people. The scholars have been talking about it probably for 100 years, but really since 89 uh, at, the, at the very least. But in normal people have never heard this word privilege used this way until just like 2014 or 15 at the earliest. And then it was mostly male privilege uh, with the feminists pushing it out. And then it became white privilege and everybody's got some kind of privilege or another. And if they're teaching about privilege, this comes out of, very, out of a very specific tradition, which is the critical theory tradition. And so they're probably teaching critical race theory if they're talking about some racial privilege, white or brown or whatever. Uh, and that's what you have to do is you have to call them on it for the you know parents or whatever. They have right. to call them on it. And they have to say these concepts are core to, to critical race theory. Are you teaching children, for example, that racism is an ordinary state of affairs in society and that we always have to interrogate it? That's the first core tenant of critical race theory. If they're, if they're teaching that, they're teaching critical race theory. Right. Um, if you want to talk about more simple things, though, are you using privilege and separating kids and teaching them, you know, different materials based on that? They're doing critical race theory if they're having, like, the privilege walk. Right. It's just happening. And you, it, maybe it's right. not even just critical race theory. Maybe it's elements of queer theory. If they're talking about decolonizing the books or the curriculum, they got some post-colonial theory mixed into this or something. Right. Or maybe something like tribal crit, depending on where you are, which is crit that's critical race theory applied to the indigenous tribal context. Mm. If they're talking about it, you know, if you're in Texas or something, they're talking about it with Latinos, that's called lat crit, which is a branch of critical race theory. If they're talking about awakening a awareness of what it means to be white, that's whiteness studies. That's a branch of critical race theory. So you have to be able to, you have to, Understand some of the things it does and ask these kind of diagnostic questions or make diagnostic statements, proclamations. Yes, you're doing this. You're doing this. Here's right. the thing my kid brought home. Privilege. You are doing this. And you have to just absolutely not let them get away with the gaslighting and the lies. Right. And the overall goal is to tear down, to deconstruct, to, what would well, you, how else would you say it? Well, the, the overall goal in total, is to manipulate people into allowing them to 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 seize power and to re reconstruct the entire institution, if it's a school or whatever, into a vessel that reproduces critical race theory or critical queer theory or gender theory or whatever, any right. of these critical social justice theories. The goal is to get theory into, as with kids, it's programming them. With older people, it's reprogramming them to think as critical theorists of one stripe or another and their goal is to co-opt the institution so that they're going to induce that critical consciousness into people and they're going to that's the critical race praxis is to awaken consciousness i can't say the portuguese properly from ferrari on the spot but it's like conscientia sizao or so, i'm not gonna sow or something <laughs> i don't know how to pronounce it on the spot but it's a long word and it means awakening a critical consciousness it's coming to a consciousness of the 
critical theory interpretation of the world is adopting the theoretical lens. The praxis is making people have that. So if they're trying to make your kid at a school have a race consciousness, they're doing critical race theory. And the goal is to program them to think that way, to awaken them to a new religious consciousness. And I say religious very seriously. That's right. It is a religious consciousness of how the world works. But rather than a religion that you might want to actually join, it, it's a religion based in grievance and vengeance and resentment and to see how the world doesn't live up to a perfected utopia that they can't exist. Um, so, and that's what the, that's what they're trying to do is co-opt the institution to do that. And yeah, we said a school. It could be a church. Well, that's what I was going to refer to is that just recently we, we had the Southern Baptist Convention in Nashville. And where the gentleman, first of all, there was, you know, you had Mike Stone, you had Randy Adams, and then you had two fellows that one was Dr. Al Muller and the other one is Ed Litton, of which at Dr. Muller's seminary, as well as other seminaries throughout the Southern Baptist Convention, there are men that have been teaching critical race theory yeah. and intersectionality. Huh. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt. It's not as if we're trying to create some sort of uh, scandal without any proof. And right. then as well, Ed Litton has been saying things and as well uh, supporting things that would be as well bringing in line the concepts of critical theory, critical race theory, intersectionality. So all of this language has been progressing. And yet then they as well, oh, no, nothing's happening here. Oh, we don't teach critical race theory. Would the same thing apply there in a didactic sense? Yeah, of course. I mean, what it does is it tends to what these... The way this gaslighting often works, sometimes they just come right out and say stuff like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what it is. Right. That's draining epistemic authority. They're making sure that you don't have the grounds. You don't feel like you have the ground to speak and say that you know what you're talking about or what you see. Right. But a lot of times it's done through linguistic manipulation. And they are very good at twisting or the meanings of words and in specific coming up with multiple meanings of a single word, um, like diversity, might mean... Oh, we have lots of different kinds of people with different kinds of backgrounds or different kinds of thought or different kinds of expertise or different kind of different, whatever it happens to be, diverse, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it means somebody as the, the University of Texas diversity, equity, and inclusivity program that they're trying to implement says, it actually doesn't mean that because that would be in violation of civil rights law if they explicitly put that in a formal document. Mm -hmm. What it actually says is that it means people who are skilled in diversity, meaning mm -hmm. diversity ideology, meaning these critical theories of identity, like critical race theory. So all of a sudden, diversity now splits into two words. It means something everybody likes, the idea that we're going to have different perspectives, different kinds of people, different, 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 mm. and then something that only they want, which is that we're going to have people who are skilled commissars in this ideology. Mm. And those are the, the, the trading between those ideas. They say, oh, don't you want diversity? And you say, yeah, of course I want diversity. Why wouldn't we want diversity? Or you say, well, I don't know about this diversity program. They say, well, you don't like diversity? And they're like, well, I don't have any problem with diversity. You know, you have to say these kind of responses. But what they're actually going to do is trade in that happy meaning. And then over here, the second they have power, the second they get in that position of power, it's the specialized meaning. Mm -hmm. Oh, what we meant is we're only hiring people of a certain kind. And that, right. that in the communist literature is called, literature is called entryism. It's getting inside of an organization and infiltrating the, the organization, often removing uh, good people first by one means or another. But it's getting inside of an organization and bringing in ideologically conformist uh, views that are going to start changing the culture from within. So I use the example of diversity, but you're going to hear it in the church. What it's going to do in any institution is latch on to the specific words, whether it's business jargon, educational jargon, or things that you would hear in a church setting. Um, what's a good example of something you'd hear in any church setting that uh, they might co-opt? Um, you know, love thy neighbor. Oh, well. Something like that. And that was across denominations. That was uh, within the Southern Baptist Convention. It was in the PCA. It was in the Roman Catholic Church. It was the same thing that they latched onto. Yeah, so they do this all over the place. We'll come back, love thy neighbor. We'll come back to that, but... And we'll be able to connect these two. Just mm -hmm. within education, they have this other concept that was pretty useful. It's an interesting approach called social-emotional learning. It's supposed to figure out how to engage, you know, the social aspects and the emotional aspects that kids go through when they're learning. This is a concept that was, been, was being developed in education for a while. They've co-opted that. And now it's all about microaggressions and, and critical race theory type things. And so now when you hear social-emotional learning, you don't quite know which one they mean, probably until it's too late. And then you find out which one they meant. So they co-opt terms like that, right? Well, 
underneath the idea of the social emotional learning, they have this idea of critical love. And so love thy neighbor, Mm -hmm. critical love, right? All of a sudden love has, there's a specific meaning of critical love, which means, and this is what Paulo Ferreri talks about all through the pedagogy of the oppressed, that you, that this all proceeds from love. It's critical love that you're, all the revolutions, revolutionary thought proceeds from love, love for the downtrodden, love for the oppressed, and the love to break that damn system that oppresses them by any means necessary. <laughs> you know, through violence, he's praising Che Guevara, he's quoting Lenin, you know, but that's love. And so when you talk about love thy neighbor and it's critical love, mm. all of a sudden, loving them means you have to awaken them to that consciousness. You right. have to awaken them to the consciousness so that they will help you break the system that's hurting their brothers and sisters, that's mm-hmm. keeping out, you know, we famously talked about, you know, if we don't have room for so-and-so, we don't have room for any of us. Well, that exclusion there that's happening, that's hurting people. And if you don't love them, you don't love thy neighbor. Now we have to do this, though, with a critical consciousness. And there was like a false dichotomy that's created. It's like if, if you don't love your neighbor, then you're someone who's going to go go to work. You're going to try to keep your business open. You only love money. But if you love your neighbor, mm-hmm. you'll continue to be shut down. You'll go along with this because you're going to kill grandma. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they twist the meaning of the word love there, and then they don't even have to change mm-hmm. the, what is it, the second commandment, I guess, from the gospel. They don't even have to change it. They just change the meaning of the key word, love thy neighbor. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you change the word love to critical love, which means turn them into a friggin' revolutionary. And, uh, which I don't think that that's what it was about (laughs) to tear down the entire society. Um, and and you're off to the races with something very perverse. And this is what makes it very difficult. And people feel confused and they feel gaslit and they feel unable to argue back because, well, how do you, how do you go to a Christian church and argue back against love thy neighbor? Hmm. And you're in here in the weeds, like, you know, something's wrong, but you don't know what's wrong. And then you start to articulate, you finally find some vocabulary and you're like, You know, I really think that the word love here has more sides to it than this. Mm -hmm. You know, you brought up the kind of COVID thing and it's like, yeah, we do have to show love for our neighbor in the sense that we want to protect the most vulnerable in our society and take some precautions. But we also have to look at the other side. We got to look at, we got to love our neighbor who's losing their business. We got to love our neighbor who's, you know, depressed Mm -hmm. and going to commit suicide because they've been locked in their house for nine months. We've got a lot of people different. There's a lot more to it. And they're like, no, 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 no. You know, love is very important. You know, love the neighbor. And they they stick and you just, you're like, something's wrong. And then they're like, well, you don't understand love right. You don't understand love right. This is the right Mm -hmm. definition. And that stuff Mm. is meant to keep you confused and unable to articulate what you mean and to make you feel stupid and to make you feel bad and make you feel like you're missing something. And it's psychological abuse. Mm. And it is an intentional manipulation that they're using. Mm. It is an intentional manipulation used to gain power. And if people don't see it, not only are they unable to fight back, but they're made to feel increasingly crazy. Like they just can't grasp anything in in life that's solid anymore. A, A kind of nutty philosopher that's in this vein, I guess he's vaguely a critical theorist. He's a bit late for critical theory. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman refers to the, what this produces right. as liquid modernity, right. where all the solid things have been turned liquid and you can't grab onto anything. Mm-hmm. Um, Zygmunt Bauman, I mentioned him not because he's like, you know, a mainline critical theorist, but because Henry Giroux, who was radicalized by Paolo Ferreri right. and is the huge uh, critical pedagogy, critical education guy, he quotes Zygmunt Bauman all the time. He was a big influence. This liquid modernity thing is a thing that they kind of want to be in. They want to make everything liquid so you can't grab onto it. And they screw around with words to do it, and they gaslight people and tell them they don't see what they're seeing, that what they see isn't what it obviously is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, it's very anti-racist to go around and talk about race all the time and make everything about race. It, it's just blatant psychological manipulation at that level. Mm. So when you just, you just mentioned anti-racist, and a lot of people would say, well, that's something that I should be doing. Yeah. Is being anti-racist. Yeah. But yet, when you're telling me how to be anti-racist, you're telling me that I need to employ <laughs> elements of discrimination. <laughs> yeah, it's anti-racist is one of the most poisoned, twisted words in their little game. It feels you keep feeling gaslit all the time. So you you, you do have to employ. Literally, we go. You have to employ discrimination. Literally, we go to Ibram Kendi. We read mm-hmm. a book called how to be an anti-racist. So this should be a definitive guide. This guy's held up, he's paid tens of thousands of dollars, given tens of millions of dollar grants. This guy should be able to articulate how to be an anti-racist. It's the Mm -hmm. title of his most famous book. 
You turn to page 19, what does he say? Well, he says that uh, discrimination that produces inequity is racist. Discrimination that produces equity is anti-racist. Then he says that in order to, to, the only remedy, he says, the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. They absolutely want to mm -hmm. cook discrimination into the definition of anti-racist. It gets worse. Mm-hmm. There's this more. There's a more superficial layer. You have to join a cult to be an anti-racist, right. according to them. Right. How do you know it's a cult? Because well, Robin DiAngelo has been right. talking about anti-racism in education and, and other circles for over a decade. They're trying to throw talk about gaslighting. They're like, she's not even a critical race theorist. She's out. <laughs> right. She's. They've even said they, that she stole critical race theory ideas, yep. mm -hmm. and they're they're so desperate to get her under the wheels of the bus. And the, Ibram Kendi, they even say, well, he's not really a critical race theorist either. Right. Right. You know, and he's like got a statement that just can't. I everything I do is based in critical race theory, or not quite everything, but it's something along those lines. Is you know what I do is based in critical race theory. It's got a foundation in critical race theory. He's like, oh, he's not one. He's a historian. Right, you know, that's right. what his PhD is in history. He's not one. Right under the bus. Right. As soon as you can criticize him, and so you know they all go. The it doesn't this this movement doesn't care about any person, not even its own leading lights. But anyway, Robin D'Angelo with anti-racism. Right. What does she say it is? She says in probably several books, but at least in the book, Is Everyone Really Equal?, which she wrote with a, another critical education person, Aslam Sensoy, she says, anti-racism is a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process right. of self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism. In other words, praxis. In other words, you have to be a freaking communist mm -hmm. to be an anti-racist. The same trick mm -hmm. that Bella Dodd described in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bella Dodd, defected Communist Party USA member, testifies the House Committee on Un-American Activity. She's like, oh yeah, we come in. This is how communists do it. We come in with nice sounding words. And she didn't say right. anti-racist. But this trick still works. She said, for example, we'll say that communists are against fascism. So we're the anti-fascists. And if you're right. against communism, you must be a fascist. Right. And you hear it said like that and you're like, that couldn't trick anybody. And look where we are. <laughs> right. <laughs> look where we right. are here in uh, 2021. Right. You know, after a year of that railroading our society. Mm -hmm. So, you got another manipulation with anti-racist. You got Kendi's manipulation that means anti-racism means discrimination in right. order to achieve equity goals. You got to be a communist. Mm -hmm. You got a, an ethno-communist or an ethno-Marxist. This new updated. It's not the vulgar Marxism of yesteryear. It is a more advanced and sophisticated one. It only takes the best parts of Marxism, the best parts of racism, and mixes them together. So it's not racist or communist anymore. They say that one too. It's not communist. It's not Marxist. Mm -hmm. Bull. Anyway, so we've got. I mean, like, like for instance, like right now we're drinking lemonade. Well, it's right? Meyer lemonade. But Meyer yeah. lemonade, okay, Meyer lemonade. But you actually pick those I off picked the, the tree, lemons, yeah, and then you combined it with sugar and water, right? That's, and then you chilled it. That's right. And but it still has the elements of the lemon in it. You can taste it, yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, the lemon <laughs> really stands out. <laughs> yes. So yeah, but so we've. Yeah, th it's just like yeah, it's, it's a mar It's not. These are not Marxist lemons, um, but <laughs> the, the the element is still there. That's right. I don't know if that's a failed analogy. But. No, I, no, it was. I got you. I got you. Right. So, you've got the you've got the BS Kendi manipulation on anti racists You got the BS D'Angelo manipulation, and you, at the root, you kind of see they're the same. Right. He says we have to discriminate for equity. Equity is equal outcomes. That's somewhere in the communist spectrum, mm -hmm. right? She says we have to take up praxis. Mm -hmm. That's somewhere in the communist spectrum, the Marxist spectrum. Maybe it's not vulgar Marxism. It's something there close. So they're still manipulating. It's, you know, anti-racist. Well, you didn't think you had to be an, a communist to be an anti-racist, probably. But you have to be a racist communist to be an, an anti-racist. And then it gets worse than that. Mm. Because where does this all come from? And this is where it gets disgusting. And a lot of people don't realize this. I read Kimberly Crenshaw. Mm. I read Mapping the Margins, which is her 1991 paper, right. her most famous paper. Right. And in that paper, she explains, she has this very famous paragraph near the end where she's railing actually on elements of postmodernism. She doesn't want race deconstructed. Mm. She's like, no, 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 we're not going to deconstruct race. That is a, you know, they say race is a social construct. And she's like, but that doesn't mean it's irrelevant. That doesn't mean it's irrelevant. That's a vulgar social constructionist thesis, the vulgar construction thesis. Hmm. So it's it's a special kind of social construct that has consequences. It's structurally and materially determinant. You read in Richard Delgado, but especially structurally determinant, structural racism. Right. Structurally determinant. It the structure determines your life because it's a superstructure, not Marxist at all. Um, 
That said, she then explains that what makes race different than anything else postmodernism might deconstruct mm. is that it's imposed mm. upon an oppressed people. So the oppressed people don't occupy the position of privilege mm. necessary to deconstruct that which oppresses them. Mm. They can't, you can't deconstruct something that's being imposed upon you because you don't have the power. And she's saying people are missing that. But what she's also saying is it's wrong to impose racial constructs on people that have a negative valence, right? Mm. So how do you turn back to Robin D'Angelo and read in White Fragility, there's no such thing as a positive white identity. Right. And you read in all of whiteness studies, we need to make white people aware that they have a race, or that they have a race, the white race, because they're, part of their white privilege is being able to not think in racialized terms. So we have to racialize the white experience into the white race, which must be, there's no such thing as a positive white identity. Mm -hmm. Must be a negative valence. So they want to impose a negative racial identity on a racial group, which they know is not only wrong, but the central sin of their entire religion. Mm -hmm. But they're, they feel justified. That's how you know it's vengeance. They, they feel justified in, in doing the exact thing they think is evil to another group to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. They know it's wrong, and they do it anyway. And here's another little kicker for you where they gaslight you. How does that imposition work? Crenshaw tells us. Crenshaw tells us how that imposition works. You have to have systemic power, mm. structural power, to impose a race on a group and make them have to have a racial identity. Mm. Well, they're going to impose whiteness studies exists to impose a white racial identity that must be negative. They are racist and they know it mm. in their own terms and they call it anti-racism. Talk about gaslighting people. Mm -hmm. So then you have parents, let's say, that are becoming aware of this in their schools. You have those same parents and their kids going to church and they're hearing the same kind of responses from the schools now from their church. And they're watching media too. And if you know if they're switching through, maybe they're in a hotel room trying to find you know, a more conservative channel, but they're switching through and they see like MSNBC. And they're hearing <laughs> the same sort of responses going back mockingly and so forth. And as well, you hear this thing that, well, it's all a Republican conspiracy theory. And now they're trying to, to somehow tie in this response against critical race theory. Uh, against intersectionality and the other concepts that go along with it, uh, critical gender theory and so forth. But they're they're now trying to say, well, that's all part of almost a QAnon sort of. Yeah, it's, a <laughs> it's all a conspiracy theory, such right. projection. Right. Critical race theory itself is a conspiracy theory. And the iron uh, law of woke projection is what again? The, well, you just, it's everything they do is projection one way or another. They're either right. telling you what they're actually doing or they're telling you their plans. Right. It's an iron law. It always applies. You, we take any woke doctrine, we can figure out how it's probably projection. So they're definitely projecting in this right. case. Critical race theory is a conspiracy theory. Now, here's some gaslighting for you. I've pointed this out, and I cited Charles Mills' 19, I think, 97 book, The Racial Contract, where he argues that there's a racial contract that are socially enforced. Everybody's in on it. All white people subscribe to it. They never hear about it. Nobody ever talks about it. Nobody ever whispers, let's keep the black race down. That's what we do as whites. Nobody ever says it. Nobody ever says it. There's this thing called the racial contract that Everybody just kind of figures out by the social order and they all sign on because they all want to keep their privilege. So they're selfish. And that's what critical race theory is actually kind of trying to break up. They believe that, that white supremacy is basically a conspiracy against all other races. Brown people have brown complicity, so they're apparently in on it to a level even while being oppressed. Mm -hmm. They have this whole cockamamie conspiracy theory where every person who has any racial privilege or whatever privilege at all is in on the conspiracy without ever having even heard about it, without even knowing their conspirators. That is based upon systems. It's all based on systems. That's right. how they hide it. And so the, it's a, the, the biggest, grandest conspiracy theory that's so slick that the conspirators don't even know they're conspiring. Right. It's amazing. And so then they tell everybody else, that's a conspiracy theory. But here's the gaslighting. I pointed this out. I point this out. And people say, oh, Charles Mills, no, you can't say that. Right. That's not critical race theory. That's the critical philosophy of race. And do you know how hard it is to not swear at somebody who does that to you? Because you know they're lying. They're manipulating you. Right. That's a critical philosophy of race. Oh, well, color me corrected. Right. What the hell? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, so now you, you see this happening then, of course, through media. And now all of a sudden, this, these same, you know, mom and dad go to work. <laughs> and they, they go to work, and then all of a sudden... That's not happening there either. Oh, yeah, so now they're at work, and you're going through all this training to, to identify microaggressions. Yeah, that's not critical race theory, even though it comes straight out of Daryl Wing Sue, and it's based right in the idea, the impact over intent, which is comes back to the idea of, of critical race theory that, that really is one of its incentive structures is milking the idea of disparate impacts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have different outcomes by group. There must have been racism hidden somewhere. Right. Impact is what matters, not intention. We're going to take intention out of discrimination law. That's really what it exists on one level to do, mm -hmm. critical race theory being the it here. And so now microaggressions, it didn't mean, it doesn't matter, you know, if uh, you try to insult somebody, you know, uh, as many people who know you will know, there might be Chinese people somewhere in the vicinity somewhere. <laughs> and so if we said long time no see, somebody might say, oh, you can't say that. And you're Chinese people. They might be offended, right. you know, because it comes directly. It's a direct translation from what is it? How do you or something like that mm -hmm. in Mandarin? It means long time no, no see. see. So, yeah, so that's a microaggression against them to, to say that. It's probably... Uh, microaggression to say that the, the virus that came from China came from China. You know, these kinds of things. These are microaggressions because it didn't matter what your impact was. No, I was just ex identifying the geographical area. I was right. just using a phrase that I've heard, you know, your intentions don't matter. Impact matters. Well, that's tied right to disparate impact, which is the the piece of law, SCOTUS jurisprudence, that they're trying to manipulate with critical race theory in order to get more of their power, more of their grift. Mm. So, Yes, it's there. And they will lie to you. They'll say, no, this is diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is right. just unconscious bias training. Unconscious bias isn't critical race theory, except it is. That's exactly what they say is that people are socialized into a racial context and they don't understand that necessarily. And it creates bias in them that since they're not aware of it, that it's unconscious. If they start to become aware of it, they don't like it. It's willful ignorance. You know, they have the, if they are of a minority status and they start to become aware of it and they're like, I don't think that. it's internalized racism. It's false consciousness. Of course, unconscious bias is part of critical race theory's underlying ethos. Maybe it's not critical race theory. It's critical race praxis. But critical race praxis is critical race theory. So they're just lying to you. And it's so frustrating. And People have, I don't know what to tell people, except you kind of have to know some mm. of this stuff to be able to say you're lying. Right. This is, you're, this is actually a manipulation of words that if people knew the words, if they weren't silly words like praxis that nobody but Marxists have used for a hundred years, if they weren't silly words like that, everybody would see, children would see straight through it. Mm. Mm. It's just transparent manipulation. Mm. And I don't know what to say, except that anybody that's doing that is somebody you shouldn't be trusting. Anybody mm -hmm. who's willing to do that, they're either they're either ignorant or lying, one right. or the other. And in either case, they don't need to have power over you and your your workplace and your kid's school over the curriculum or whatever. It's just absolutely infuriating. Mm. You know, it's not in your workplace. It's just DEI and unconscious bias. It's not in the schools. We're just doing it to your children. You know, we're not teaching them. We didn't make them read Mary Matsuda. We just teach them exactly the stuff she talked about mm. so so then something happens i remember you told me we were discussing through this and, and one of the goals was to almost get rid of the human resources departments or i mean i think know. it'd be great to get rid of human resources departments because that's where they they start to manipulate the most um human resources departments not entirely i mean there are other right. issues I that understand. come up in right. workplaces but one of the main functions or large functions of human resources department was to be a band of experts who's going to advise management on how to not step into a civil rights lawsuit right and so again the weaponization and i don't think we should overturn the civil rights act i know some people out there think that i think it's a terrible idea i think that we should be applying it in a even-handed way that uh, has narrow tight definitions and that requires intention. We're not going to do this disparate impact nonsense. Um, we need, you have to have been discriminated against. Somebody had to be meaning to discriminate against you, right. uh, in my opinion. But mm. yeah, it's a huge vector into corporations or into any of that kind of uh, business world institution. It's through human resources and, the, and through the manipulations of con convincing management, oh, you're at legal exposure here because if you don't, blah, blah, blah. Well, there, I think a lot of corporations are about to find out that they're at a lot more legal exposure than their HR department, which is blind with critical race theory. 
realized. Mm -hmm. So then you have people that are going through these trainings at, at work that are mandatory and so forth. And they're being, first of all, introduced to the concept of microaggressions. Then they're being asked to go through additional training to make sure that they tear down the way in which they had related to other people within work in yeah. the past. And so what does that do to a workplace when you end up creating all these little mini, mini conspiracy theorists within your, within your Well, workplace? I mean, it obviously is going to erode interpersonal trust. It's obviously, right. especially across uh, groups, uh, different de um, demographic groups. It's also going to, with these trainings, a lot of times what you end up with is people literally kind of getting, I don't know if um, abused is the right word, but I think it's abuse. So here's an example. Some Somebody might have to sit in the room, in the middle of the room, and have or take turns going around the room. Confess. Everybody has to confess to racism to like the black person in the room. And now all this person who got along great with all of their coworkers, and you have to have something to say, or you're just suppressing it, is now thinking all of his coworkers are racist against him, <laughs> right? <laughs> something like this. And how awkward is that? And then it's like then all the conversations have to engage it and get weird. But this that's all like just corporate culture falling apart. That's nothing compared to the strategy, which is you're going to get some percentage of those people who are like, yes, this right. DEI training, spot on. This is what we need to do. And now you have what are called apparatchiks in the organization who are going to push the ideology into the organization. They're going to side with the ideology. They're going to constantly, they have to do praxis. They're going to constantly try to get other people involved. They're constantly going to take steps in that direction. Constantly going to have more committees, more meetings, more of the kind of bureaucratic nonsense these people love to manipulate. And then you're going to have a probably a few percent is that. And then you're going to have a larger percent, but still total a minority of your workforce that's going to become real sympathetic to those ideas. Mm -hmm. And so they're not all in, but they've heard them and they're like, yeah, more yes than no. And, you know, I, they have a point. They really have a point. Then on the other end, you have a few people who are like, uh-uh, no, we're not doing this. Right. Well, you know who those people are now? Mm -hmm. And if, some, some, if something goes down, you know who you're going to crack down on. If you're going to start having praxis on people in the office, who's going to get accused of racism? Well, the people who didn't like the training. Right. 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 And so you start to identify dissidents to be purged. You start to create apparatchiks and, and commissars out of a small group. And you get a band of sympath uh, sympathizers that are like a human shield of cloud around them or ideological human shield around them. And so then it's only a matter of time. The precipitating incident's coming. Somebody's going to say something wrong. There's going to be an incident in the public square somewhere. Somebody's going to die or something. Uh, not referencing anything specific. And then the next thing you know, you have a polarizing event and your conditions in your office are not ready right. for a polarizing event. Your institution, your church, your business, your school, it doesn't matter, mm. is now primed for a precipitating event to smash the glass. Everybody's in their own corners. Everybody's at each other's throats arguing. We've seen it play out again and again. Everybody's fighting with each other. You're a racist. No, I'm not. You're awful. You know, you're, you don't understand anything. You don't know what you're talking about. And the whole thing, imagine trying to run a company like that. Mm -hmm. That's best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario is they actually succeed mm -hmm. and they convert lots of your company. And then your company turns into an infected organ that's just going to do this more and more and more. And maybe your job was to make shoes. Well, it's not anymore. It's to make shoes that promote the message that do praxis right, right. you know right and, and it could be race and it could also be within gender and it could sex be race and so it could forth. be gender it could be disability it could be right. fat it could be anything that's considered an identity category it could be mental illness it could be literally they've uh, they have a pantheon and i use that word in the yeah. in the old religious sense they have a pantheon of identities that have to be deferred to under all circumstances that are then put into a hierarchical structure under the Alchemical magic of intersectionality, which I still think was just an extortion racket laid out by the by these radical uh, socialist feminists, black feminists in the Combahee River Collective, basically, that Crenshaw scooped up this idea to get these people to carry water for the biggest radicals. Mm -hmm. People had the most radical politics. We're going to get everybody else to carry water for them. Mm -hmm. and by saying, oh, we're all in solidarity, as Kimberly Crenshaw says in Mapping the Margins near the beginning can't do much change with a few disparate voices. You need the voice that, what well, we've learned through the civil rights is you need, the civil rights movement is you need the voices of many millions speaking together, not a few disparate voices. And if you think of racism, therefore, as an individual act or even an institutional act that happens in this institution, but not at that institution, you can't cobble together a coalition of millions of voices. You just have somebody's complaining that they had racism against them and somebody else is complaining and you deal with them, you reconcile if it's reconciliation, you do damages if there's damages. 
you do what people recognize as justice in an individualist race uh, based system. Right. You can't have a movement that's going to overturn society that way. You need many millions in solidarity. Mm. And so now we're going to do we're going to build an identity politics coalition out of it. And that's really what these trainings are about is to try to bring that into your business and if it succeeds, you become a new pump that churns more and more of this stuff out. Right. But that it's not happening. Right. Don't believe your lying eyes. It's not happening. The, right. the lamp is definitely not being turned down. Right. You know, and, it's something else. And then you have some CEOs that have, in the past few months, come out and said, we're just not going to do this anymore, you know, at our company. Yeah. We're, we're not going to practice this sort of thing because it's tearing us apart, Yeah. you know, well, internally. The, the, the data, like it or not... You can't do something and not generate data. You can try to hide the, the data. You can try to prevent its collection and analysis. But if you decide that you're going to stick this into a whole bunch of companies, mm. you're going to generate results. And people are going to be able to look at those results and they're going to be able to see what happened. And what you see is a very large percentage of these organizations that have taken it on having fractured corporate cultures. We heard from the base camp CEO saying that it was That's just right. a hot mess within the company. We're not doing this anymore. I think... It was so fractious when he did it, uh, something like a third of his workforce like bailed out. They right. like, threw tantrums, and he was like, nope, your tantrum doesn't move my heart. And they're like, called him names. I know that manipulation. It doesn't work on me. You know, right. the whole thing. And then a third of them quit or something like that. And he's like, right. bye. You know, right. it's like the angry, abusive spouse who threatens to divorce you every five minutes right. or whatever. It's like, okay, just leave. You know, I don't need this in my life anymore. See you, bye. Um, so... These other companies that we're seeing, diminished productivity, yep. money going into the hole, office environments that are actually hostile. Um, people, there, there were even years ago, they were already talking about that these trainings reduce the willingness of males to mentor females, lest mm -hmm. they get accused of sexism or something, you know, some banal comment being interpreted, misinterpreted because impact over intent as a sexual harassment case. You see, white leaders and companies less willing to mentor blacks. And if it's true that blacks tend to be in fewer positions and women tend to be in fewer positions of senior leadership, you think they're going to get there with that mentorship? Mm -hmm. Not going to get there. So now you have people holding up because they don't want to end up with one of these accusations labeled on them because once you're accused, you that's it. You're host. You, you have no options. That's right. It's I don't know how anybody can look at this. Plus, some did not think, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. Plus, some proportion of your company's resources are now dedicated to producing, like, stickers that say Black Lives Matter on them or something rather right. than some product that anybody actually wants. Right. Whatever your company was meant to do. You're, like, supposed to sell cat food, and you've got to put, like, pronouns on, on the cat or something like that. And it's like you're just wasting resources to have to redesign the label. It's, there's just a waste of resources, a, a, a diversion of mission. You're company, your organization, your school, maybe your school's mission should be educate kids and get them above 30% proficiency by 12th grade. Maybe that's the school's mission. No, but now you have the side mission. Turn them into little uh, ethno-communists. Mm. And so people see the silliness going on around them. They have uh, folks from the left that are basically saying numbers of things. They're either gaslighting them and saying, well, you know, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Yeah. This, this isn't the critical theory that you're looking for. You really, this isn't happening. There is you no true critical race oh, theory. Oh, they laugh at them and you mock at them, you mock them and so forth. Or they say it's a conspiracy theory that's being created by the same folks that brought you the craziness of QAnon. Yep. And so, in other words, you're crazy if you believe any of this. You're, you're crazy if you oppose any of this. You're crazy or you're just politically motivated. That's the other right. thing these people love to do. They can read your mind. They know your intentions. Right. That's why intentions don't matter because they know your intentions. They were bad. They were the worst ones you could possibly have. They already know. And so they can read your mind. You don't oppose critical race theory because you don't want racist garbage being hammered on your children who are cr coming home crying over what race they happen to be and telling you hor horrible stories and showing you horrific assignments or reading some weird masturbation book for seven-year-olds or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, no, it's because you're a dirty, nasty, bad old conservative and you just right. have a political agenda against progress. You want to turn back the clock back to 1950, which, by the way, is where critical theory basically stopped the clock in terms of its analysis. You know, society right. was systemically racist in a fair, I don't like the word, but in a fair way, you could say it was definitely systemically racist. When Martin Luther King said that society was systemically racist speaking in the 60s, he wasn't wrong. It was. 
Then we passed a bunch of laws and started to do some work. And we got away from that. Right. But they want to lock it there because that's when their argument kind of worked. Mm -hmm. Critical race theory or critical theory of any kind, while I think it's a dangerous tool, could be used to tear apart really corrupt power. Right. Right. It could be used to tear apart corrupt power. But there actually has to be that corrupt power. There, right. The problem is that it's getting applied where that corrupt power is historical. Right. This is why one of, people say, well, you don't even know the definition. This is one of their gaslights, right? You don't know the definition of critical race theory. I'm like, yes, I do. The definition of critical race theory is racism used to be really bad. Give us money and power. Right. And now what we're going to do is create another corrupt system. Oh, it discriminates gosh. against people. Yeah, I yes. mean, Jordan Peterson pointed out that the least the hierarchies always happen. They always develop. We have this intersectionality meant to build a hierarchy. They call it a matrix of domination that they're going to flip upside down. That's going to be our new hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Not only it's not really going to be races, I think we talked about this one time, that if you take a pyramid and you flip it upside down, right. it's not an upside down triangle because those sides are just going to fall down to the bottom. What right. stays at the top in this new broken thing is going to be the, the party. Right. The party, the people who have all their politics right are the ones that are going to stay up. Everybody else is going to be the rubble heap at the bottom when you flip society over. Um, I got so excited about my metaphor, I lost my train of thought. But <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they want to flip society over, though. And, oh, Jordan Peterson and hierarchies. Hierarchies always form. And Jordan Peterson says right. the least corrupt form of a hierarchy is based on competence. Competence is the thing. Merit is the thing that generates the least corrupt hierarchy. And you were just telling me about a contest that you saw today. <laughs> there, was a, yeah, there was a contest for anti-meritocratic videos. Right. Like, how do they judge them? On what merits? <laughs> right. it, it's like, I mean, not to invoke a critical theorist, he was technically third generation, which had already lost the way. It, well, it, there's, we could get into a whole talk about how critical theory has this first generation with Horkheimer, its second generation with Marcuse, and then it goes off into Jürgen Habermas, who talked about performative contradictions, which was, was about yep. to say, sawing off the limb you're standing on. And that's not... That's not the relevant branch. And so people can point to Habermas and say, like, ah, critical theory softened up over time. Yeah, well, the radical black feminists that followed Angela Davis didn't soften up. They started setting our society on fire. Mm -hmm. And that's the true line. Mm -hmm. Habermas is the distraction. So he talked about performative contradictions. Well, that's a, a contest to judge the best anti-meritocratic video, anti-meritocracy. But meritocracy builds a hierarchy that's minimally corrupt. So if you have an ideology that is expressly against merit, what do you think it's going to do? It's going to favor corruption. That's, That's why, right. why I have the iron law of woke corruption right. to go along with the iron law of woke projection. Right, right, right. And look, any, scratch a wokey, you're going to find corruption. You know, we're not far from Topanga Canyon here. Right. Million dollar house, build a wall around it in an all white neighborhood. Right. One of the founders of Black Lives Matter. Right. Right. Oh, well, she's just got to watch out for her family with her million-dollar houses in Topanga Canyon. Like, this is gorgeous. Right, right. Like, this is a special place. Are you kidding me? Right. So, Iron Law, you scratch a wokey, find corruption. Mm -hmm. Just like if you scratched a communist back in the day, because that would be vulgar wokeism or something like that. You find a, find corruption. It's how do you take create a new, totally bogus elite that gets all the benefits of society while you literally have... I read today, somebody sent me a note saying that in the Holodomor... Oh. There was literally Ukraine. at yeah. least one story that came out of a child that was eating himself. Oh. Yeah. Meanwhile, they feasted in Moscow. Meanwhile, Walter Durante feasted and partied legendary parties in, in Moscow, Moscow while writing the article saying, Ukrainians hungry, not starving, that won a Pulitzer Prize in the New York Times. Right. And so that's the thing is that the systems that they're talking about. They still about. have that Pulitzer. Yeah. They have not disclaimed that. How shameful. So the systems that they're talking about bringing in, that they believe are more fair and equitable and so forth, have been shown throughout history to be as corrupt or more corrupt and as well to just the blatantly lie. Yes. The gaslighting. It's Durante was gaslighting. They gave him a Pulitzer. Exactly. Nicole Hannah-Jones writes the 1619 Project. It's totally bogus. Right. They give her a Pulitzer. She's gaslighting us about American history. Right. Like, we don't know that 1776 was the founding. We don't know what the Declaration of Independence says. You're gaslighting us. Right. And you give him a Pulitzer. Right. Pulitzer. Every major institution just about is trying to gaslight us on this stuff. And people don't have to take it. So how do how does an average person then, who's who's listening to this, 
how do they how do they work through the fog of the gaslighting? It's hard. You actually got to learn a little bit about it. Right. Like imagine you're in that film, right? I know it's a fiction, but imagine you're in that film and you're the, the, the guy's turning the lamp down just a little bit every day. And he's like, no, you're crazy. You actually are going to have to look real close. You're actually going to have to, if you could, I know it's in the 40s or 30s or whatever, but bear with me. We got these cool cameras. You have to do a light meter. Right. You actually are going to have to learn enough and find a way to be able to spot the lie, spot the gaslighting and say, no, I know what I'm talking. You have to be confident. You right. actually have to be almost a little bit chauvinistic. Right. Utterly confident. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I see. I know this manipulation. It doesn't work on me. I didn't mean to make a mm -hmm. poem. I did not mean to rhyme that. So you do have to be able to do that, though. You have to be able to spot the thing. You have to be able to say the thing. You have to be able to, this is what you're doing. Oh, you say critical race theory isn't being taught. Well, it's being done. Right. And I know it's being done because you're teaching my kid white privilege. And you're teaching my kid equity. And you're teaching my kid systemic racism. And I've seen what you've been doing throughout society over the past several years. And it's everywhere. Absolutely. In There's the nowhere that it isn't. That's right. And I don't get five minutes anywhere I go. I can't turn on a ball game. I can't do nothing. Can't get five minutes away from this. Can't go to church in half the churches, which is a, its right. own hideous embarrassment. Right. Where, you know, you're watching, uh, there was Major League Sports, the NFL, basically. Everything about them now is about identity politics that they're communicating. Yeah, and, and so, everything. So why can't you just make it about football? Because identity politics is what was known to be able to break America. That's why. Correct. That's why. Correct. They know it is. Right. They know that identity politics, those many, the voices of many millions cobbled together, is so much more powerful than treating people as individuals. They know that if they can whip up a resentment collective, it's so much more powerful than actually genuinely disenfranchised individuals. They know that if they can whip up an identity collective of aggrieved say, if it's, you know, racial black people, that LeBron James can pull up in his Ferrari and shout about how oppressed he is. They know that you can build these collectives, including super rich and powerful people. You can maybe even get, I don't know, a crown prince or something. Mm -hmm. So you have this happening and people are saying, no, 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 this is nonsense. What are you doing? And yet they're being told that you don't know what you're talking about. Don't believe what your eyes are telling you. Don't believe what you're hearing with your ears. Yeah. And so it's time for people to actually start speaking up. That's right. You know what? It takes, it takes a few hours to read Critical Race Theory and Introduction. It takes one minute to read the opening paragraph in which they tell you what it is. It takes about 10 minutes or less to read the opening chapter. And if you read that opening chapter in 10 minutes, three or four times, you know enough critical race theory to, yes, you do know the definition, and yes, you can spot it when it's in your kid's school, and don't you BS me anymore. Right. Ten minutes of your time, a few times, and you're going to be, you know, catching on. Of course, tons of materials being put out. I put them out at new discourses. Yes. Put them out all the time so people can start to, I, I can de-gaslight you. Come get de-gaslit. Go put it in the world. And in new discourses, you have the social justice encyclopedia. Exactly, because it's all, it's not all, but it's so much, sometimes it's just straight lies. But a lot of times it's linguistic manipulation. It's trading on multiple meanings of words. So I write an encyclopedia to try to get people to see, well, when they say democracy, they mean when everybody's absolutely equal. And then we have one person, one vote, because they're absolutely equal in all ways. Nobody has extra privilege. Nobody has extra money. If you have more money than I do. Um, you know, you can amplify your voice. You can buy a microphone that I can't buy. You can, you can, you can get hookups that I can't get. So you have more voice than I do. So it's not really one person, one voice or one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. We have to be totally equal. You know, Harrison Berger on handicapper general come like, make sure the pretty people are ugly. The smart people have to listen to annoying noises so they can't think straight. You know, the whole thing, we gotta make everybody perfectly equal before we have democracy. So you can mm -hmm. go read. You know, this is what you think you mean by democracy, and this is what they mean when they say democracy, and right. that presupposes communism, just like Lenin actually said, but nobody knows that because who in the world reads Lenin except them. Right, right. So there is a way. There is a way. To be able to, to identify the gaslighting, to be able to respond with confidence. You have to be, just like if you imagine yourself in the movie, you have to be able to see the thing happen. See the linguistic tricks, see the manipulation, see them say one thing and apply a different one. Catch those little things like in the University of Texas at Austin mm. uh, worksheet that I talked about. 
where it says, by diversity, we mean people skilled in diversity, and then start asking some hard questions. What in the world does it mean to be skilled in diversity? They think you're gonna gloss right over that. Read mm -hmm. the stuff they put out. Skilled in diversity, what in the world is that? Right. What is, what, how do you become skilled in diversity? Please explain, provost. Mm. You're responsible for this, or associate vice president, or whoever is actually behind it. You're responsible for this. What does that mean? What does skilled and diversity mean? So you've got to be attentive, eyes open. You've got to be vigilant. Republic, if you can keep it, you've got to be vigilant. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And spot these manipulations and then start asking hard questions. And when people can't answer them, start demanding resignations. Mm -hmm. And then people can reclaim their liberty. They can reclaim their future. They can reclaim hope as well that somehow we are going to be able to do these things without the constant deception, without the constant um, you know, heavy handedness and tyranny that comes across and that people can actually live free. And, and I, not crazy. And not They're crazy. not crazy and not driven crazy all the time. That's right. And that's something everybody needs to know. That's why I wanted to say that. You're not crazy. They're trying to drive you crazy. Critical race theorists are trying to drive you crazy so you can't fight back against critical race theory. You're not crazy, you know.